EFF, which stands for Electronic Frontier Foundation, is a digital rights organization. And when I say that to people, then if they're not familiar with EFF, then their response is, what does digital rights mean? Um, and the answer is kind of nothing. The answer is, it is a, it's a sort of made up term. Your rights are your rights, your right to free speech, your right to privacy, uh, your, your freedom of religion, you know, those things are your rights. And the reason why EFF exists is because when technology changes, there are always forces in society at the level of corporations or lawmakers or whatever trying to relitigate those rights. Um, for example, people saying, oh, now that encrypted communications exist. Uh, we need to rethink your right to privacy. It's too, it's too dangerous for people to have the right to private communications anymore. Um, or alternatively, uh, now that uh, these, these cool uh, technologies exist that law enforcement can use to track people around a city, now you shouldn't be able to, to have your freedom of, of privacy and dissociation anymore. Um, because it's so much more convenient for, for them to be able to follow you around. And EFF's real point is saying, no, your rights are your rights. Um, and w when technology changes, then uh, corporations and the legal system have to continue to respect your rights. Um, you asked when it was founded, which was in 1990. Um, which was a long time ago, and I, I was not around for a lot of that history, so there's lots of parts of it that I don't know a whole lot about. Um, but it's interesting. It's grown and transformed in some ways over the years. Um, but that mission of uh, teaching both the courts and policymakers uh, about how your rights and freedoms work in the technological world, that has stayed consistent. So how does EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, defend and promote internet civil liberties? We have, we, we sort of think of our program work in three main buckets, um, which are tech, law, and activism. Um, so for the tech, we actually have programmers on staff who are creating tools that you can use to protect your privacy. Like software? Uh, yes. Um, they're kind of the, the most famous thing that we make is a uh, browser extension called Privacy Badger. Um, that You know how when you go to a website, um, there might be these like tracking tools from other websites that are that are following you like there? Like cookies? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or like f the way that uh, a lot of sites will use the Google Analytics tracker in order to measure the analytics or like ad companies that also then get all of this access to, to your activity. Um, so you can use this tool called Privacy Badger that shows you on any given website how many of those trackers there are um, and, and lets you t turn them on or off, give them uh, permission to see what you're doing or not. Um, and we could, we could talk about the other tech projects too, but so that's what our mm -hmm. technology team does. Um, and then we have a legal team. We have a many lawyers on staff, uh, who do what's called impact litigation, uh, where they're taking on cases specifically for the, the purpose of effecting change in, in, uh, making sure that the courts respect your civil liberties. Um, and then finally is the activism team, which I'm the head of, uh, which is about empowering people to defend their rights to policymakers. We do a lot of stuff targeting Congress, but to other people as well. Um, and a thing that we've become increasingly focused on over the years is looking at how the decisions that companies make affect your right to privacy mm. just as much as the decisions that Congress makes. Oh, that's interesting. I really want to talk to you about that because I think it's a really interesting part of this discussion right now is the public versus private 
censorship and banning and all that and what, what, what it means, but um, um, great. So what kind of cases does EFF look to become involved in? What we're, and I should preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and you, maybe, maybe you should get somebody from our legal team on here one day. Um, but these are cases where we need somebody explaining to the courts how technology works in order for them not to make decisions that have huge unintended consequences. Um, I'll, I'll give you the, well, the, uh, one of our big cases that went on for 10 years and, and was finally just recently settled, um, has to do with your right to fair use. Um, the, the facts of the case, as I understand it, were a woman put on, put a video on YouTube of her toddler son dancing to Let's Go Crazy by Prince. Um, and, and Prince's people had the video removed from YouTube, uh, under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, one of the things that came out of that litigation was the court saying that when a rights holder, uh, like Universal Music Group or Warner or whoever, um, does a takedown notice, they have to uh, analyze whether the use was protected under fair use or, or, or whether it would be protected under the fair use doctrine. And in this case, and we can talk more about fair use if you like, but in this case, it, it very clearly was fair use. It was not hurting, it, it was not impacting the, the audience uh, for the Prince song in any way. Um, and it was just this tiny little 45 second video or whatever it was. This is very clearly the kind of use that you should be able to do without having permission of the copyright holder. So that's what you guys do is you, and cor com correct me if I'm wrong, you help people who need to, who need to fight these kind of cases one way or another and you, you go in there and, and help them? Is yeah, right? yeah. And there's, uh, in a number of cases, we are actually the, the lawyers. Uh, mm -hmm. for the... Yeah, your the legal team, you were people, saying, right? People in the case, right. Um, so, like, that's what it was in Lens versus Universal, which is the case I was just talking about. We were part of Stephanie Lenz's legal team. There are also a number of cases where we uh, file an amicus brief. Um, so we are not actually the lawyers in the case, but we are saying to the courts, look, there's an important thing here that you need to make sure that you get right. Um, and this is all kind of like, this is kind of how impact litigation works. It's looking for the cases where you can try to make good law or fix bad mm -hmm. law. Um, how does that work? Do you guys go to Congress or how do you, how do you become involved in helping the lawmakers make the right choice if you're not actually the lawyers? Or well, so the, I mean, we can talk about Congress in a minute, but but this is just in the realm of the of the courts. Um, I mean, I can I can give you another example of sure. a of a of a a case that shows where like the court's interpretation of the law becomes really important. Sure. Um, I do, in addition to the other stuff I work on, I help some with our uh, patent activism. There is a really important Supreme Court decision uh, from two thousand. 15, I think I might need to look that up, um, uh, which is called Alice v. CLS Bank. What the Supreme Court said in the Alice decision is that an abstract, unpatentable idea uh, does not become a patentable invention uh, just because the uh, Perform, because you perform that idea on a computer. What do you mean? Um, like, let's. I'm. I'm. I'm trying to think of a. Of, well, I'll give the actual example in Alice v. CLS Bank. It was essentially the patent in question was was describing these kind of 
business processes that had existed for a long time about how you process these certain types of transactions. Um, and the patent said, doing all of this stuff that is understood, that is not a new invention, that is just a routine business practice, but doing it on a computer. Mm. And that being the thing that turns it into a patentable invention. Because it's now a tangible thing, like a tangible software or something like that? Is that <laughs> sort of. Way? Like, in our view, it shouldn't make it a patentable uh -huh. invention. Um, software patents, on the whole, have the... <laughs> It, I, I always think that uh, you should, if, if you wonder how useful software patents are, you should just talk to a software developer and ask them what they think about software patents. And I've, I've talked to so many developers, even ones who have patents in their name, who will just kind of laugh at the whole concept of software patents. Uh, well, we talked with Marta Belcher about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about um, just this software patents, also you know patents in regarding uh, in regards to blockchain and technologies built on blockchain. Mm -hmm. And she did talk about that how some big companies I don't want to get this wrong I think it was Twitter maybe not but that they actually do hold several patents but because apparently this is the consensus in the community is that they still it's still open use. They, they allow anyone to use it, but they do technically hold the patents, but they don't enforce it. Yeah, this is this is an interesting issue, and I'm glad you had Marta on because she, I'm sure, could, could talk at much more length about this than I can. Um, there are a number of uh, ways that people have tried to have patents and also stave off kind of the worst uh, effects of software patents in the form of these kind of op uh, open licensing agreements you're talking about. Um, and Tesla famously did this oh, right. a, a few years ago where they put out their press release um, saying that they are not going to sue anybody for patent infringement on these certain patents. Um, these are... The fact that there's so much interest in these kind of different uh, licenses or waivers or, or ways of kind of hacking the patent system, that's the title of the paper mm -hmm. that Marta worked with on us. The fact that there is so much interest in that space points to the bigger problem of this sort of fundamentally broken patent system. Um, it, and so in the Alice decision, in our view, the courts brought a little bit of fairness to this fundamentally broken system by clarifying that uh, these patents on uh, unpatentable ideas don't become a patentable invention just because you say doing it on a computer. Um, like I, I could not get a, well, you could not get a patent on hosting a talk show <laughs> um, and you also shouldn't be able to get a patent on hosting the talk sh show just because it's a talk show on the internet uh, as, as opposed to being a talk show on, on TV. Um, and so, so you have this precedent set by the Supreme Court, but these things are tricky. And sometimes even the, uh, the neither side in a patent infringement case is saying the thing that we think actually needs to be said about how... It's it's not just that the person wasn't infringing, it's that this pat patent wasn't valid in the first place. Gotcha. Well, so I, I want I do want to ask you about about this more, but um I do want to finish up talking about EFF just in a bit of context. <laughs> okay, so um, we talked about yeah. the first two branches of EFF. Um wait, is that where we left off? <laughs> yeah, you Sorry. told me you told me the three, which is go ahead and recap okay, it again. Yeah. Um, so the, the three kind of buckets of EFF's work are our technology, which we've talked about, um, and law, mm -hmm. and I've given you an idea of what our legal team does, and then activism, and mm -hmm. that's the, the part of the organization that I'm kind of in charge of. Um, and that's really about empowering people to speak out to defend their rights, um, be it sending messages to Congress to tell them to vote for or against a certain bill. Um, or, well, speaking of patents, we just recently um, had a campaign where we encouraged people to write letters to the patent office. Um, and then we're 
increasingly looking at ways that we can kind of use our community and use this uh, multitude of angry nerds that regard emails <laughs> uh, to affect change at uh, corporate practices too. Um, we just recently launched this campaign called Fix It Already that the purpose of it is to urge internet companies to make these, most of them are actually really simple changes that they could make in like an afternoon to protect your privacy. It is absurd in the year 2019 that you cannot make your contacts on Venmo private. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.